So we should probably get started with the super high energy show. <laughs> I feel like going to get uh, a coffee while I'm talking to you guys. You're going to get a coffee while you're talking to us? Well, I'm in this, this office that a uh, partner of ours was kind enough to lend me when I'm stuck down here. And they have a Keurig machine here, which if you ask Sean Hennig, I shouldn't be using. But You should be smashing it, actually. You should, should be smashing. You should be smashing a Keurig machine you don't own. <laughs> since, since we are not a political show, I'm going to go ahead and make a coffee on the Keurig. It's probably full of mold anyway. <laughs> That's damn well, I, I peed in that cu- Keurig. I... <laughs> we are, since we are not a political show, I'm going to make a... Uh, a unit of donut shop here. Donut shop? What's donut shop? Well, it's one of these little pods. It's called donut shop. Does it taste like a donut shop? I mean, I don't. I don't know. know. I mean, my my options here are French vanilla supreme from Gloria Jeans, caramel cappuccino, which just sounds awful, Pike Place roast from Starbucks, or Folgers. Oh no! I almost the donut shop's decaf. We can't have that. Dude, that that would. That would crush you. Well, you know what? Well, the donut shop. Wait, that's that's ridiculous. Because uh, what donut shop would you ever go to where you got decaf coffee? I mean, donut right. shops are known for caffeinated coffee. For the sake, of- it has to taste like powdered donuts, right? <laughs> for the sake of comedy in the show, I'm going to go ahead and do a caramel cappuccino. My elitist Italian espresso sensibilities are going to be offended by this greatly i'm sure the advice provided on this podcast is general advice only all statements made are considered by the participants to be accurate but accuracy cannot be guaranteed it has been prepared without taking into account your objectives financial situations or needs all participants in this podcast including guests may have a financial interest in any or all of the products or services mentioned Before acting on this advice, you should consider the appropriateness of the advice having regard to your own objectives, financial situations, and needs. If any private products are detailed on this podcast, you should obtain a product disclosure statement relating to the products and consider its contents before making any decisions. Where quoted, past performance is not indicative of future results. Recorded November 17th, 2017, it's the Money Path Podcast. With your hosts, Bob Iacchino and Mike Arnold, founders of Path Trading Partners. On this week's episode, the What and the Why is sponsored by Motive Wave. Go to pathtradingpartners.com and download your 14-day free trial. So let's join Bob and Mike with a casual conversation of news and the markets. Oh, well, I had... I the had... beverage stacks. I'm supposed to leave 50 cents by the Keurig machine. What was that? You have to pay for this copy? Cook County Beverage Tax. No, but there's a sign here that says leave 50 cents for Ron Emanuel to come and pick up. (laughs) It's in the mail. (laughs) Uh, Don't even start with don't even start with taxes and the tax bill and everything else with me. Speaking of Chipotle. Speaking of Chipotle, what, what does that have to do with taxes and the tax bill? And are we ever going to get tax reform? Is Chipotle ever going to stop getting blamed for poisoning people? <laughs> Almost died. I have not seen a full follow-up, but I, it obviously, I, I think Chipotle put in a temporary low because of this news that uh, Chipotle tumbles after Supergirl actor says he almost died after eating at the burrito chain. He uh, Jeremy Jordan blamed the burrito chain for making him severely sick. He uh, put it on like Instagram and all his social media. I know I've advocated for them in the past, but they're terrible. <laughs> He's laying in the hospital bed with an IV in his arm. They're like, we're trying to reach out to him. Uh, the, but the, I've not seen a follow up on that, and obviously it hasn't hit. Like there's, there's no been not been a massive outbreak, so either it just affected him or something else. But it's interesting because Chipotle got down to uh, two sixty three this week on that news, and now it's rallying back. So it's it's almost you know when there's bad news that comes out and the stock doesn't go down anymore, it's like temporary bottom. I'm sorry, is 
Are actors so self-absorbed that they call being positive about a burrito chain advocating? <laughs> Not as, com- yeah. as a comparison to politicians, no. <laughs> I know I've advocated for them in the past. Well, I don't think Chipotle needed your advocation. <laughs> I'm you know, hoping to continue to land some good products, and I'm going to continue my work as an advocate, advocate for Chipotle. Wow, this this guy's just a classic idiot. <laughs> they should just put on the menu, you know, uh, guacamole, beans and rice, botulism. Jeremy well, George nothing... is only person to report. I'm yeah. just looking <laughs> the Daily Meal. Jeremy Jordan is the only person to report illness from local Chipotle. <laughs> and by yes. the way, calling him a Supergirl actor, is he an actor in a show called Supergirl? Yes. Or is he yes. a super female actor? No, he's a. I know it was a terrible headline, wasn't it? I like read that going. I would not want to be referred to as a super girl actor. Yeah, don't go all, all all Al Franken on us. It'd be like, <laughs> hey, I needed to be. In, I he might need to have an investigation opened on himself about. <laughs> Which I thought that was the Al Franken tie-in, but oh boy, oh boy! I think I need an investigation opened on myself. Good job, Al. <laughs> the, the only thing we've ever heard, but this guy, we got photos on him. <laughs> uh, so, so that's so. So Chipotle, though, I would not. I'm not the looking to be bullish yet on Chipotle. We have no bottoming formation, although it's rallying up right now to 287, and we have major resistance at 300, w- along with the weekly declining rotation zone. So, uh, not nothing to do from the bullish side yet. Besides, watch what happens when it gets into that rotation zone. And there you have it. There you have it. What else do we have? We have uh. <laughs> This guy oh, think there's two, any chance he got sick from something else, maybe. It, it, there is. I think we can let the, the <laughs> Well, he is a Supergirl actor. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> I, as you can see, am in the hospital. I have fluids in my arm. I need to be a victim today. <laughs> I'm going to blame it on my lunch. Oh, my God. Well, this person posted this. I'm sorry. I, this makes me want to jump off a bridge when I read this. <laughs> I just want to thank my wife for being amazing and taking me off the ledge when I was on the phone <laughs> about to die. And Chris Wood for holding my hair back metaphorically. Thank you so much. It's been a night. You, you just were throwing up. You wuss. <laughs> my God. <laughs> the self-importance is absolutely sickening. I'm on a ledge now. I need someone to metaphorically hold my hair back because I'm vomiting from this idiot. Uh, I need somebody to metaphorically hold my hair back, which is saying something. <laughs> well, they are. <laughs> well, in an, in other news, that uh, is this going to turn around Disney and Snap? ESPN looks to reinvent itself with Sports Center for Snapchat. The network is launching a twice daily show aimed at millennials on Snapchat. They'll have a 5 a.m. Eastern morning edition and a 5 p.m. Eastern time evening edition. The morning show will be a recap of what happened the night before, and will the afternoon episodes are going to be about trending topics. That's gonna that terrifies me. That come up during the day. <laughs> that, that trending topics and ESPN at this point and Disney terrify me. <laughs> because who knows what's going to end up on that the afternoon show? But is that? Is that going to be enough to save Disney's declining uh, revenues from ESPN and uh, turn Snapchat around, which is now trading at twelve fifty seven? I don't know. What's your What's your take? Are you going to watch the Disney uh, ESPN Snapchat show? I am not on Snapchat, so no. <laughs> but they're going to roll out their new platform and completely redesign it to cater to old people. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> This is, are we starting out with ridiculous corner? Is that what we're doing right now? <laughs> so um, my guess, that with- my guess is that the users of Snapchat aren't all that interested in sports. I don't know why I think that. Well, because you. But ESPN is all, all politics now, right? Sports is only ten percent of what they talk about. 
That is pretty much, they have managed to politicize pretty much everything. That's why I'm terrified on the afternoon show. Like, so and so, instead of like their, the so and so scored like uh, uh, 30 points in the game last night, it's going to be so and so decided to have this political stance last night in the middle of the game. <laughs> <laughs> Let's report on that. It's going to be like not facts anymore about their performance or like the on base percentage or the free throw percentage. It's going to be like, in quarter three, he managed to protest this by wearing these kind of sneakers. It's good. Oh, great. <laughs> so there we have the, the our new our new uh, our new forum for that. And uh, in other social media news, you know, thank God for Snapchat because if it wasn't for Snapchat, I'm sure we wouldn't know that Supergirl actor Jeremy Jordan was sick from Chipotle and he was the only one, and he was about to die. And someone had to metaphorically hold his hair back. That's going to be the time. I just, the whole I show. just, I can't today when reading that. I just, I can't. Ugh. All right, sorry. Triggered. I'm triggered. I've been triggered. <laughs> oh boy, you've been triggered. Oh no. I have been How's your here. coffee? Uh, this stuff is like you remember, like the cereal milk from like Tricks. Oh, cereal milk. I love cereal this milk. This tastes like the sugariest cereal milk you've ever had in your life. Ugh. Yeah, like the think back to your childhood. Think about the sugariest one you ever had. Then add two tablespoons of sugar to that, and that's what this tastes like. Oh, boy. Like the people who used to put sugar on their sugar cereal? Mm-hmm. I had friends growing up. I'm like, you just put sugar like on your um, fruity pebbles, and that's. I do, like, ima- I do imagine you as a five year old looking at your friends and going, "Do you realize that's about seven grams of sugar more than the recommended allowance?" Yeah, like you're like five. <laughs> <laughs> you know the long term consequences of the decision you just made. <laughs> <laughs> and don't eat at Chipotle because one day. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you have a wife so she can save your life. <laughs> I was on the ledge. That's why I ended up shaving my head because so I wouldn't have to metaphorically have somebody hold my hair back. I wonder what level of dollars in the lawsuit from Jeremy Jordan for the blotchiness. My face was blotchy. I'm blotchy. I'm suing Chipotle for a million and a half dollars. Ah, oh, so. Well, he could now go to the local new uh, Facebook sets to take on Yelp with its new app called Local. <laughs> so it's another, you know, they tend to copy things like Instagram, mm-hmm. copied a bunch of Snapchat features and, you know, WhatsApp and everything else. And they just modify what's hot out there. So now this new app, which I don't know why they need a new app, but they need a new app. will still track will track events and even offer curated suggestions for local events you might want to attend but its main focus is now on surfacing places to visit partially based on recommendations from your facebook friends it's very similar to yelp in terms of scope you can look for restaurants attractions bars and other local going on except it's driven by facebook's data interesting so i saw an interesting thing i don't remember the guy's name but one of those celebrity chefs the guy who eats the weird stuff like goes in, it's not Anthony Bourdain, but it's like the guy who goes and eats worms and goat eyes and things like that. He's a bald guy, kind of heavy set. I saw an interview with him, and he said that he he said Yelp is useless for finding good places to eat when you're out of town. He said what he does is he go finds out who the three or four best chefs in the particular town he's going to are, and then he goes to their Facebook page or their Instagram and he sees where they're eating. And he sees what they have to say about those places. And he says it's just much more reliable than Yelp and much, you know, he ends up with better meals. And I thought that was interesting in light of this story. Because now if you're going to be on like this Facebook local app, you're going to be following the same guys. Essentially, Facebook is going to be doing for you what this guy used to do on his own. I thought it was interesting. So I, I have high hopes for the success of this particular Facebook app. Well, there we go. Fantastic. There you uh, go. I also have a uh, pullback on a weekly chart. It pulled back this week to the weekly top of the weekly rotation zone, rotating back up as we speak. The new projected price targets are 185.57 and 188.23 on Facebook. We never talked about the uh, the Roku IPO. 
By the way, I do keep drinking this coffee. The Roku IPO was fascinating, wasn't it? I mean, that IPO, it was 1575 and traded up this week to 4880. Now trading 3939. That's so that's the only recently successful one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. That's uh, the as well as that's done, that's sort of an indictment or rather a support of the cord cutters, wouldn't you say? Yes. Definitely I in support of the cord cutters. Yeah, so the stock's got a little uh, hot mm -hmm. right now. And we, so we have I'm, no probability for a pattern there, right? Because there's not enough data. Now, as we're starting to get, uh, I mean, we have the weekly, we have a nice weekly rotation zone now. So key support right now is about 35. Mm -hmm. That we'll all we'll be watching for to see if that holds on a pullback. But I wouldn't chase it here. Yeah. It, because uh, it's, it, it in the last what one two three four I mean in the last seven days it essentially went from nineteen dollars and thirty cents up to forty eight eighty. What symbol did they go with? R O K U. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so that's that's not only didn't talk about, but if anybody has been following Roku, do not. I would not recommend chasing it here. I'd wait for uh, a pullback. I don't know what the major. Oh, they had earnings. That was it, and they, you know, they only lost. Let's see, they lost ten cents. Uh so it wasn't as bad as everybody thought. Mm -hmm. But we have another unprofitable company. So there you go. It seems to be the trend now. If you're t if you're uh, a, a, if you're a certain kind of company, you don't have to be profitable. No, you or, just keep taking in investors. Oh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, oh, oh, that was. I, I almost want to. I almost want to get to that now. Can we get to that now? Or no, we no, we. we right, yeah, that, right, right, that's right. like eating dessert before dinner. I'm drinking dessert right now with this triple uh, yeah, you, cereal. You have your you have your uh, uh, corn pops milk and <laughs> uh, corn pops milk with sugar added. At least you don't have queso sauce on it because that would push you over <laughs> the edge. Uh, Walmart. I like this. This was a great headline. Walmart now featured on Walmart's website. Higher prices than stores retailer want. So higher prices. I don't even know how to say it. <laughs> <laughs> and action. Wal Walmart stores wants to charge customers more to buy some products online than in stores. That's interesting. So, well, it's mainly because the cost to ship certain stuff. Like, and I was actually looking at this now. Uh, my, my wife likes a certain kind of cereal that's somewhat harder to get. And so I went to look it up on. If I was having it shipped from Walmart, it was four dollars and sixty cents a box. But if I went, I could order it online, but have it picked up at the local store because they had it in stock. It was only three dollars and thirty cents a box. That's a significant difference. Yeah. Now, even if I ordered enough boxes to qualify for the thirty-five dollars of free shipping, essentially I'm paying an extra buck thirty per box times, uh, you know, eight boxes to qualify for free shipping. So that mm -hmm. is. You know, that's the, sort of a big difference. I end up paying $10 more for the product. Sure. So, so I am actually going to order it and online and drive to the local Walmart where I'll probably pick up a couple more things and along with it to justify the trip. But that's what they're doing. They are they used to be keep online and in-store prices equal for many of the Sprocker products, but now they're starting to try to drive the uh -huh. customers to the store for things that they can't ship profitably or ship at least revenue neutral and they're not willing to eat the losses anymore and let uh, me guess this for this particular cereal you can't find it on amazon i do amazon's even more expensive really okay that's what that was going to be my next question so i did look at and i looked it up i looked it up on multiple things and that's why because there's nobody else who could do it cheaper so they're like all right well we'll just be sort of in line with or close to what amazon's charging but if you want the discount you're coming to the store right uh which is a great tie into amazon because amazon slashes whole foods prices in round two of grocery wars grocery wars bob grocery wars <laughs> grocery wars 
Uh, <laughs> now, among the price cuts, Whole Foods said it would sell organic turkey for three forty nine per pound to all customers, while Prime members could buy it at an even lower price of two ninety nine a pound. I was in Costco uh, yesterday picking up rotisserie chickens. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> They're so, they look at me so weird because every time I go, I just buy two chickens at this point. They're like, you must really like your chicken. <laughs> Although the other day I did go and I, I had two rotisserie chickens and a bottle of Jack Daniels. Mm -hmm. And the guy looks at me and I'm like, lunch. <laughs> <laughs> the guy actually fell over laughing. It's like, that's the funniest thing I've heard today. In a decade, <laughs> that might be true. <laughs> so... Uh, That's awesome. But uh, uh, organic turkeys at Costco were for members because you're going to get in there. Were members were two ninety nine a pound. Just a price comparison to a Whole Foods. So Whole Foods and Costco, if you're a Prime member, are essentially the same price. Uh, for organic turkeys coming up in in uh, Thanksgiving, they're also going to uh, value pack boneless. Skinless chicken breasts, organics, and no antibiotic. They're cutting the price on, as well as canned pumpkin, organic broccoli, organic salad mixes, organic russet potatoes, and organic sweet potatoes. This seems to be a, a target for Thanksgiving with a lot of these things I'm witnessing. Wow. So they're, that's the round two of grocery stores. Grocery well, wars. This year for Thanksgiving, though, you have to get permission before you touch the turkey breast. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> okay, Al Franken. <laughs> uh, and, and in other Amazon news, Amazon's cashierless store is almost ready for prime time. We talked about this months ago. Remember that on the sh where I you do. walk in? You, they sort of take a photo of you, and then you scan your phone when you walk in, and mm -hmm. then you go walk around, pick up items, and anything you leave with, you just get charged on your, your account. Uh, they're almost ready to roll that out. They've worked out most of the bugs with it. So some challenges still remain, but now they are looking to hire. Uh, they've shifted from hiring engineers and research scientists to uh, hiring people to actually roll out the stores. And then firing those people months yeah. later. Well, these are the people who sort of build the stores and put everything into place. So... Yeah. Uh, that's they're going to roll that out and we're going to see how that works but if they actually got the technology down to that there was a funny article i was reading it that they were testing the concept by amazon employees dressing up in pokemon outfits trying to fool it like okay <laughs> pikachu they all, they all went in as pikachu like <laughs> i'd go in as jeremy jordan <laughs> All from Supergirl fame. <laughs> Supergirl actor Jeremy. Yeah. So they couldn't, and then they, they, that was, I think that was what, that, what made them go mainstream was that Pikachu couldn't even fool the checkout process. So mm -hmm. if you can't fool with being Pikachu, it's good to go. So far in the uh, Amazon HQ2 sweepstakes, Dallas is a top contender. Crystal City is a top Crystal contender. City. Mm -hmm. Where's Crystal City? Uh, I believe that's in Florida. I, that sounds like a super. I'm sorry. Girl. Surrounding it's it's near Washington D.C. Okay. So Crystal City and Baltimore is in the top twenty-five. That's according to sources. I'm not going to name. It, it, well, you said you were you were thinking Chicago could be in the running. I was thinking, but it's so far not not so much. Interesting. Well, I, they probably have to pick like either the Washington D.C. or Baltimore area because of the tie-in with uh, the CIA. There you go. They got to be close. <laughs> I figured it out. Look the at Washington that. Post. Yes, it's all there. It's all the pieces are together. All I want the pieces. I in place. All the pieces. Uh, speaking of pieces, oh, this is a good tie-in. Pieces. Game pieces, puzzle pieces. Hasbro sets its sights on Mattel. Do, so, we, has, do we have any idea how much those two toy companies have gotten into electronics? Yeah. Are they uh, are, are they in them a lot? They I mean, were they in the big video game crash of the 80s, for sure. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they dived in big time. Mm. Hasbro and Mattel. Gotcha. So Hasbro was is looking to take over Mattel. Uh, that's been... 
sort of an off again, on again rumor for many years. And now I guess they submitted an offer, but later does Mattel has rebuffed Hasbro's latest takeover approach. And this is from people familiar with the matter. Mm. So we don't know because we don't know what the offer was yet. Uh, but Mattel has informed Hasbro of its proposal undervalues the company, does not take sufficiently into account potential for regulators to reject the deal based on antitrust concerns. What? <laughs> you can't have Barbie and G.I. Joe manufactured by the same company, people. Right. It's not good competition. Uh, earnings corner, Walmart earnings a dollar a share, excluding items. So that was not gap compared with forecast profit, 97 percent uh, revenue beat 123.18 billion versus estimate of 121 billion. Same store sales for U.S. stores, excluding fuel up. 2.7% compared with anticipated 1.8. So they uh, they pretty much across the board beat everything. Quote, we have momentum and it's encouraging to see customers respond to our store and e-commerce initiatives. Chief Executive Doug McMillan said, existing customers have become advocates for popular initiatives like online grocery and free two-day shipping. And as a result, new customer suppliers and partnerships are coming to Walmart. Their uh, total revenue climbed 4.2%. So, and uh, Sam's Club is also doing better, which uh, Walmart owns Sam's Club. So, in case anybody didn't realize that, so Sam's store sales at Sam's Club were were up two point eight percent in the third quarter compared to one point four percent one year ago. That's about Walmart and their stock up to a hundred dollars and thirteen cents. That nice round number now pulling back ninety seven thirty four. It's made its first run at a hundred. So. And we know people love that round number and generally sell the first couple runs to 100. And then yes, it breaks through with a vengeance. Yes, they do. Because that $100 is how I just come up with the stock of 100 bucks. Got to be 100. Got to be 100. So, company that didn't do so well, uh, but is holding key support still, is Best Buy reporting mm-hmm. disappointing third quarter results on Thursday. Uh, its forecast for adjusted earnings for the fourth quarter was 189 to 199 per share, well short of analyst consensus expectation of 203 per share. So it's slashing its guidance. Same store sales only rose 4.4 percent in the quarter, and in October 2nd, missing analyst estimate of 4.8. So that's a pretty big miss on same source sales. Uh, although the net income rose and their earnings rose. Uh, so, but they were really focused on future guidance. That triggered a weekly. Did that trigger? Hold on. Let's see. No, it still has. It's still like valid. I was watching this on the weekly time frame. It's still a valid weekly double top, confirmed double top, but not triggered. It has to close below fifty two ninety seven. Hey, what was the double top we were looking at last week, where the trigger was like three oh three? That was Tesla. Tesla. Yes. We'll get to that. Well, since we can just get to that now, <laughs> since you already brought it up. Can we please? Well, there first before we get to their new oh uh launch, their t- this was the headline this week. Tesla's a hotbed for racist behavior. Black yeah, I saw that one. Sued. So they're getting sued by more than a hundred <laughs> African American employees complain uh saying that there were just not good working conditions and very racist working conditions there. So we'll have to see how that play out, but that's just tying up Tesla in another lawsuit, which will could potentially hinder some things. But the big news last night, did you stay up to what well, was not really staying up, but it was 7 p.m. West Coast time. Uh, they rolled out their all new electric truck that uh, aptly named a Tesla semi. <laughs> like, what else are you going to name it? Why? Right, because it's going to be semi-complete for the life of the truck. Oh, that's a good one. It's going to be semi-built. <laughs> it's going to be semi for sale. So now the big thing was uh, Elon was uh, the big leader for this was the Tesla semi will go to zero to 60 in just five seconds. Why would you want to do that? I don't know. That's what everybody was fawning over. That's unloaded, of course. You know, this is a this is supposedly a class A transport, which is which is the big boy. It can go up to sixty five miles per hour on a five percent grade. It can go to zero uh, to sixty, towing eighty thousand pounds. Its max load in just twenty seconds. 
So it, uh, they're touting all the specs on this. Uh, it can go. Oh, they're also going to have to roll out their mega charger network. So it can go like 500 miles on a charge, but then it can get up to 400 miles of range on a single 30 minute charge. In addition, while you're loading and unloading by detaching the cab, so they're going to roll out this mega charger network worldwide. They're not supposed to start building this for a couple years, which I want to know how they can't even build a Model 3. Now they're going to roll out uh, trucks. They're starting today to take deposits on these. Like it's, <laughs> and but they did. Yeah, that's the deposits. thing I found amazing is they're they're taking fifty thousand dollar deposits already. It the more they do that, and the more they under deliver on the vehicles, the more they come across like. The the Madoff Motor Company. Yeah. Well, here's the worst part. So they did announce the price, mm-hmm. and they didn't the announce they. Yes, they did not announce the price, and they didn't announce everything else. They didn't announce a lot of. They announced like some of these lot of specs, like how fast it could go and everything else. But they didn't now. Uh, they said it could be a level eight, but they didn't announce how much the truck like because you have to weigh the whole truck. Like you have to know how much battery packs and everything else are on it right. to figure out how much you can tow. They didn't announce that. They didn't announce the weight or anything else. So you don't know truly what you can carry on this truck. Yeah. That, how does it deal with the legal way stations? Yeah, that's right. So right. they, which is, I'm like, you didn't announce that, which is, I'm not putting a deposit down on a truck. I don't care how fast it goes. I need to know how much I can, if I don't know the full cost of the truck and I don't know how much, payload i know the max payload i can carry but i don't know how how much of that is actual payload i can put on the truck because it has to take into account the weight of the trailer and the cab in the max payload and they don't announce that so it's really pointless until they announce that right but but these uh you know uh wonderful adam jonas from uh the guy who just loves this company the analyst and you know what we say about analysts morgan stanley analyst jonas Overweight rating, 379 price target. The Tesla truck appears to be the best current diesel truck performance in every measurable way. Well, it's <laughs> diesel. Well, it's not diesel, first off. It's all electric, but he's comparing it to the diesels. But you don't know any of the specs besides they, things they touted like it can go 0 to 60. and what, uh, it, That doesn't matter. You need to know how much it's going to cost and how much you can actually haul. That's what trucking firms carry, care about. They don't care about how fast it's going to go from zero to 60. And quite honestly, I don't really want a fully loaded Tesla truck barreling down, especially it's supposed to have fully autonomous features, which they can't get it working on the S, the X yet. So I'm going to trust them to put it on a truck that can carry up to 80,000 pounds. That's going to be a fun thing. Honestly, those Tesla reveals, man, they sound like a so I was watching clips of that, and the people in the audience smiling and cheering and screaming. It was like it was a Tony Robbins event. Yes. You know, it just doesn't look like a serious company, serious reveal of serious products. It's just filled with these fanboys that want to see Elon up close. It's just the well, weirdest thing. It's just well, the weirdest thing. With what The icing on the cake for me was when they rolled out at the very end the new Roadster. Yeah. The uh, beautiful, that they, so yeah. Well, crazy fast acceleration zero to 60 in just 1.9 seconds, zero to 100 in only 4.2 seconds. Top speed north of 250 mile per hour, 621 miles estimated range. Which they are the earliest they're going to start building is 2020. And do you know you could starting today, you could put down five thousand dollars, do immediately, and then two hundred forty-five thousand dollars is due within the next ten days. So you're putting down two hundred fifty thousand dollars total, and you can be one of the first thousand people in the member of the Founders Club to get this car. So the club to wait for the car. Yes, well, which is not is projected to even be built until twenty twenty. If you had an extra two hundred fifty thousand dollars, are you tying it in? To, are you giving them $250,000 interest-free, not guaranteed, on a car that they think they may be able to build in three years? Is, and so far, they have not proven to be able to deliver on these deposits either. I mean, it's one thing to put down like a thousand bucks refundable on a Model 3, okay, you know, but you're going to put down $250,000. You know what you can do with $250,000 to generate mm-hmm. money in the next three years? I know. 
idiotic. Uh, that was the biggest. It's like, OK, we're, we don't need to raise money, but we're taking deposits on all this vaporware because we need to raise money. Yeah. That again, that's what I mean. I mean, it seems like they can now take the deposits for the truck and the Roadster and they dump it into the Model 3 to try and get some of those out. Then they announce something else, take deposits on it and dump it into the truck and the Roadster. And it continues until the Ponzi scheme explodes. This is this is like turn it's your, it's like the made off of that. It's like you know, the, yeah. didn't they also say they were gonna build a pickup truck and a model Y by twenty nineteen? Well, they don't even have enough capacity in their Fremont plant now to build more than five thousand model threes a week. Mm-hmm. They'd actually have to find a new plant. So where are they gonna build a model Y, a pickup truck, a semi truck, and a roadster? Mm-hmm. They're, they don't even – you know the cash burn to generate a whole new production facility and all the CapEx spending that has to be done, especially for a semi-truck? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and they're already burning through – how much is it at this point a day? I mean, And firing all their employees? <laughs> so this is just this, – this is – and the people who just it's, – it's the cult of Elon. It's like, oh, whatever he It really says, is. It really is. And there's a lot of people that compare it to, well, Amazon didn't make money for a long time. Amazon was selling established products. They just had to procure the products and try to get the price down and, and get the the delivery methods together. This guy's creating products and has to deliver on those products, has to service those products. And they're hard products. As many a billionaire have, has tried in the past to create their own automobile. Who was the last successful one? Lamborghini? Has Lamborghini ever gone through? Oh, Lamborghini any... goes way back, though. Yeah, yeah I mean, they ever gone through restructuring? Right? Or... He wanted a Ferrari, but they didn't... Yes. he wanted a Ferrari, but they didn't have a car he liked, so he built his own. When Chrysler bought Lamborghini, that completely revolutionized the co- the company to get modern with their electronics. So yeah, this is this is. A... We are obviously not fans of that stock on this show. What Tesla? Yeah. I I'd, think love to it... have, I'd love to have a Roadster that beautiful that does one point nine seconds zero to sixty. That'd be great. There is simply no opportunity for the intelligent person to put money down on that. Well, it's essentially you just it's I I guess you either you're not smart with your money because you're like, I'm going to throw tie up two hundred fifty thousand dollars for three years on the hopes that he'll produce something or you just have more money than you even know what to do with. So. And what what will that do? I think so. What's a thousand times two hundred fifty thousand? What's that? Two two hundred fifty million. Yeah, that's a two week cash burn for them. <laughs> Crazy. I mean, they burned through two hundred. It's, it's absurd. Uh, now, in a company that is doing something, the the Cadillac Super Cruise may lead to safe hands free driving. This is Consumer Reports has been testing the new Super Cruise feature we talked about. They've done their first extended use of the system. The system is limited to specific roads, so it's essentially geofenced on highways uh, so they can control, you know, where it can be safely implemented. Quote, this is from Consumer Reports. The way that Cadillac has implemented Super Cruise is the best example we've seen so far of semi-autonomous feature that offers convenience without trading off on safety. That's great. Jeremy Jordan could have been driven to the hospital by, by this car. Yeah. So uh, this is also from Consumer Reports, quote, too many of these features give drivers the impression they can pay less attention to what's going on. Super Cruise monitors drivers intently to make sure that they're engaged in a way that no other current system does because it actually tracks your eye movement in the car. And if it's like you're not engaged, even when it's driving, if you're not engaged on the road, then sorry, you have to take over. So it's that. Which is interesting. Unlike I saw a video for these these people, which I would never post on YouTube. Some guy posted how to fool uh, Tesla's self-driving because you're supposed to keep your hands on the wheel for Tesla. So it senses wheel pressure. So the guy puts a bag of rice on his <laughs> oh my on his Lord. and he films himself. This is how to this is the Tesla hack. So you don't have to keep your hands. Would you post that? Because if you're ever in an accident, <laughs> that is public. Did you see the fireman? What's all this rice? Yeah, it's rice everywhere covering the Is that bottom. Chipotle rice? Is that it's <laughs> No, it's like 
Oh boy! I first of all never post that online because that's going to come back to haunt you. And if you can fool your self-driving technology with a bag of rice, it's not the safest thing in the world. Where that's the one thing they like about the Super Cruise, uh, you can't fool it very easily. And by the way, fool, so what I mean by that geofencing is that it only works on specific highways. Those of at least four lanes would have limited access and no cross traffic. So. Where it can, and then they map all these high, highways and are continually to roll up more as they safely map the highways. So, if you try to engage it, and GM's like, no, that's not a safe place to engage it because of we've we've done analysis in this highway and there's too many unknown variables that could mess with the system. You can't engage it. Which a lot of these, it, even when they start rolling out to local traffic, that's what. That's it's like we talked a couple weeks ago about, you know, the self-driving stuff vehicles in uh, Chandler, Arizona, where they're all geofenced because they've mapped out all the specific roads. They know everything about them and it's all loaded into computer systems. So the self-driving technology is, is not thrown as many unknowns. It can really focus on what other cars are doing instead of knowing trying to figure out where the lanes are or trying to figure out if there's construction or trying to figure out uh very various things could throw it for a loop that's interesting and in i wonder if this will ever happen corner fisker has filed patents here's your here's uh is this the third iteration of fisker <laughs> but fisker has filed patents for solid state batteries uh they say they're going to be mass scaled by 2023 uh they claim the batteries under development have a Density of 2.5 times when compared to standard EV batteries. This should give a range of the Fisker vehicle well over 500 miles and recharging capabilities in as little as a minute. So they've filed their patents for this, uh, and they're supposedly, I guess, you know, that's going to be their game-changing thing. We'll have to see if they go bankrupt a third time. <laughs> <laughs> But if they do have that technology, uh, because Tesla is so tied into their current Panasonic contracts, that's going to be very interesting. That's another thing. Tesla's long-term contracts for batteries that use are utilizing the old technology. And I'm not saying this Fisker stuff, but there are, out of a lot of the German companies, there are these solid-state batteries that are going to roll out by 2020, which blows away Tesla's battery technology into the Gigafactories. That's another <laughs> Achilles heel that they have. <laughs> Uh, no. well, is Tesla falling now that we're doing? Oh, we haven't released a button no. yet. Okay. Tesla's rallying because of the semi truck. It rallied. It did not trigger a double yet. It's Good. a confirmed double, but a non triggered double. It closed last week at uh, at three hundred two ninety nine, and I wanted to close below three hundred. That nice round number, and now it's rallied back to the top of the rotation zone, which was at three twenty five. Currently trading three sixteen, so it's getting a nice little bump. But we have the rotation zone against it, so this is major resistance. So I'm still expecting this thing to trigger eventually once everybody gets over the uh, Elon Kool Aid party. I might start advocating for Tesla. Just so that later on I could say I've advocated for them in the past, but they're terrible. <laughs> what when uh, when their <laughs> autonomous vehicle crashes and I'm going to drive one of their vehicles and then I'm going to do a Snapchat post saying that I almost died from vomit from the drive from the autonomous swerving. I want you to I want you to take a Chipotle burrito and put it on the steering wheel, <laughs> and then take your hands off the window. <laughs> See if that holds. <laughs> Here's my hack using the Chipotle burrito. <laughs> Two dangerous things. <laughs> <laughs> Did I die from the crash or the Chipotle burrito? Or the queso. <laughs> An autopsy will find out. Was it the queso or the autonomous driving? I'm going to take a bite of the burrito and then put it on the steering wheel. And then when I crash, they need to decide which one killed me. Yeah. I, it, it, are you, is this, I hope this doesn't happen. No, it's not going to happen. Okay. Just making sure you're not putting something out there to... I am absolutely going to eat a Chipotle, but I'm not going to have a Tesla, so it's okay. going to be fun. All right. Well, you might want to do that when you get the new Roadster, once you put down your 250000 <laughs> Now, speaking of uh, fraud, mm -hmm. e Ethereum proposes guidelines to stop uh, ICO-related fraud. That's initial coin offerings. We've talked about this. Uh, 
the Ethereum developers are trying to reel in because Ethereum is one of the people, one the main thing behind ICOs. So they were at a DevCon three in Cancun, Mexico last week. The the Ethereum developers were decidedly unenthusiastic when approached for thoughts about the new funding method. Some going as far to allege that many of the projects used to raise money are a little more than quote scams. Uh, was, Fabian, can, was Fabian Vogelsteller part of that, Mike? Thank you very much, because there's no way I was going to pronounce that. <laughs> the developer behind the technology standard that helped make Ethereum tokens easy to launch, he said the problem right now is that too many people outside the blockchain space focus on tokens and ICOs. Frankly speaking, it's the least interesting part of Ethereum. He, They want to rein this in. You should have a product before you ICO. You should know how to run a company. You shouldn't have an anonymous team, and you should release a prototype first so he's saying like uh you know a lot of these companies they're anonymous they have no they have no product and they just want to raise money off of you know icos which is backbone by ethereum and ethereum sort of getting a bad name yeah so i heard a great comment from josh brown who's uh, one of the cnbc fast uh money guys and Josh Brown is at times brilliant and at times just a complete blowhard. But he said something so funny the other day when a guy was on saying, I'm a fan of blockchain, but not a fan of Bitcoin. He said that's akin to, or that's today's version of I read Playboy for the articles. Oh, that was a great comment. I believe in blockchain, but I don't believe in Bitcoin. Okay. I read Playboy for the articles. Our, our target market is 2534. Nobody knows what you're talking about, Bob. Do they not know what Playboy is for the articles? They don't know that reference. I guarantee it. Damn it. I bet. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> That's like going to spankwire.com for the ads. You know? What's spankwire? <laughs> Dot com? It's like, it's like I go to Pornhub just to see if I'll get a virus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least you won't end up in the hospital. Truth. Uh, depends now on, depends on what you're into. <laughs> we have uh, who's who's in who's the uh, CEO of Interactive Brokers? Thomas Peter. F I need your help, Bob. What's his name here? I don't see it. I've highlighted it. Scroll down. Scrolling, scrolling. Ah, oh, Thomas Petrofi. That's right. All right, Thomas Petrofi has now written an open letter to. Christopher Giancarlo. Essentially warning the CFTC chairman to keep crypto craziness away from everything else or risk accidentally triggering a meltdown. <laughs> so he wrote this whole letter, uh, you know, because this letter is to request the CFTC to require any clearing organization that wishes to clear any cryptocurrency or derivative, you know, we've talked about the futures coming out, to do so in a separate clearing system isolated from other products. Uh, if the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or any other clearing organization clears a cryptocurrency together with other products, then a large cryptocurrency price move that destabilizes members that clear cryptocurrencies will destabilize the clearing organization itself and their and its ability to satisfy its fundamental obligation to pay the winners and collect from the losers on the other products in the same clearing pool. That's not going to happen. Peter is so, Thomas is dramatic. He's being dramatic there. It's not he, likely that the CMA, I mean, look at something like crude oil where they continually moved up the uh, initial margin requirements as it got more and more volatile. The initial margin requirements on the Bitcoin futures contract, when and if it gets approved, are going to be massive. There's there's not going to be an issue with that. CME is too good well, at that. It is. Uh, I mean, some of this price volatility over the last week, it, it's been Yeah, I mean, 29% and lower in a day. But I mean, we've had we've had products do 15, 10, 15, 20 percent a day before. Oh, yeah, because you look at look at look at grains during a major drought or lumber exactly. futures. You know, you can uh, you, some of this stuff, though. All right. The most egregious, though, was a uh, Bitcoin. And, and I follow this stuff every day because we, right. we post videos on the YouTube channel. But, for example, Bitcoin uh, cash. Mm -hmm. Going from, uh, let's see, in the matter of three day, less than three days, going from a price of under six hundred to twenty eight hundred. Wow! And now back to eleven hundred. 
<laughs> that's fun. so. I mean, that's uh, some of this stuff is just absurd. And then Bitcoin going from this is this is the challenge going from seventy nine hundred on the eighth down to a low of down to a low of fifty four hundred. So what's the math on this? It went from seventy to seventy nine hundred to fifty four hundred. What percentage decrease was that? Thirty one and a half percent. So it went down thirty one and a half percent in from the eighth to the eleventh. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And now, since the 11th, it's gone back up to, it was just trading, just it, yesterday it was trading at 8,000. So it went from 5,400 to 8,000 from the 11th through the 16th. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, I, that's all I want to, this is why you got to be careful still. We we analyze this, we trade it, but this is, this is stuff you, you, you sort of have to know what you're doing and you yeah. you have to be prepared for what this is where the futures will get challenging because a 31 percent decrease and then a rally how much how big a rally was that 5400 to 8000 what's 48 percent 48 so it went down 31 percent then a rally of 48 percent all in a matter yeah. of a week yeah uh, that's that huge volatility yeah but all i'm saying is you know the cme it's not like they're not watching that and I'm not. Mike's not saying that they're not watching that. I know he's just taking the other, you know, devil's advocate here. The the CME is watching that. Initial margins will be crazy. Contract sizes will be small. And I mean, they, they've announced the specs already. To be honest, I haven't looked at them, but that they take that into consideration. It's probably closer to a an S and P mini than it is a, an S and P in terms of the specs. But initial margin will be huge, and. The good thing about the electronic systems now is that somebody can't just sneak out of the trading floor and start trading. The CMA can actually shut them off remotely now, which they didn't have the past to do. They, they never created a contract this deeply into the electronics that has a chance to be this voluminous and successful. So let's take a look. Let's see if I can find the, of the specs while you're talking, Mike, of the potential contract. Yeah. Well, I was going to go through some numbers. Let's just, I'm going to yeah. jump into the economy segment, and then we'll come back to the specs. Uh, the economy segment, uh, PPI 2.8, and that's producer price index, 2.8% year over year versus expectations of 2.4% year over year, 0.4% month over month versus expectations of 0.2% month over month. So I want to get your take on that. Don't care about producer price as much as I used to. Because it's okay. just, if it doesn't dial down to the consumer, we just, it, it hits stocks more than it does rates um, because of the producer prices rally. But we're so much of a service economy now that it almost – it's not that it's an irrelevant number. It is not an irrelevant number, but it's just less. Fifteen years ago, they, one used to be as important as the other. It's just not that way anymore. Retail sales, X autos 0.1% up. First expectations of 0.2%. Last was one full percent. So – Retail sales missed. Any thoughts on that? Retail sales, not. It's actually not a horrible number, even though it's a miss. Uh, fourth quarter is the one we need, we care about. Seasonally, this has happened. We've had a dip in the third and a rally in the fourth, and globally, retail sales were better. So, not really worried about that in the grand scheme of the economy either. It's core CPI one point eight year over year versus expectations of one point seven. That's interesting. That's not a big jump, but it's the first jump in five months. It's been 1.7, 1.7, 1.7, 1.7, 1.7. That is a little bit supportive of the Fed's theme that inflation is going to come. But we still don't have wage inflation. So it's it's not likely that it's coming in any sort of rate of speed. Is that velocity? Speed of speed? It's not coming in any sort of velocity that we're used to. Uh, this, is, it, this is the first time ever that things are different. So it's not inflationary yet. But again, that's the first bump up in five months. On the core, and uh, let's see what else we had. Initial cl- job claims. Oh, real average weekly earnings declined 0.1 percent. Uh, initial claims came in higher, expected 249 versus 235,000. Import prices came in lower, 0.2 percent versus expectations of 0.4 percent. Industrial production uh, came in at 0.9 percent versus expectations of 0.5 percent. So that's most of the numbers I saw this week. 
Mm-hmm. Anything also, else had, you saw? Yeah, we had a little bit stronger, um, I'm sorry, inline price data in the EU, although price data was a little stronger in Germany, and GDP was stronger in Germany. GDP was even stronger in Italy, which, wow. Um, Europe seems to be the one that's kind of pulling up now. The U.S. is just kind of steady as she goes. The numbers are not disappointing. They certainly, in my opinion, don't justify three rate hikes next year. But what we're actually seeing is we're seeing the probability of this, the December rate hike drop slowly, not to a level where it's not going to happen. It's still going to happen. But, and I'm going off of, for anybody that wants to look at this during the week, the CME Fed Watch Tool, which takes the Fed funds futures and calculates the market's assumption of the probability of a rate hike. And March had actually fallen from the mid to high, I'm sorry, December, apologize. December had fallen from the mid to high 90% level. I think it peaked at about 96% to currently at 91.5%. And that's for a bump up from 100 to 125 basis points up to 125 to 150. The interesting thing to me is still that March 2018, because the March 2018, if you look at the probability of another rate hike, that's been slowly creeping up. Um, it dropped from 46.01 to 45.93 today to yesterday, or from yesterday to today it dropped, but that's essentially unchanged. But a week ago it was a 45.5%, and a month ago it was a 31 and three quarters percent. So it's the second rate hike that I'm watching now because the December one is essentially baked in. I mean, it's anytime it's above 90%, it's just, it's almost an impossibility it's, that it's not going to happen. It's going to happen. Well, there you go. What else, uh, what else with the international markets? Well, have you seen uh, what's going on in Japan? <laughs> what's, why don't you fill us in with what's going on in Japan? <laughs> the ETF holdings of Japan. Um, are off the freaking charts. Total Japan, good. 74%. <laughs> yeah. Off <laughs> the dang charts. Oh. that's uh, I didn't tell you what happens when they hit 100%. They are the market. Total Japan ETF holdings, uh, 20, I'm going to assume that's in billions. 25 billion. Bank of Japan's 19.2 billion. I mean, they own everything. Who Who is head of the Bank of Japan? Hirohiko Kuroda. Uh, I just saw a couple headlines. But Bank of Japan, they are pursuing powerful monetary easing. Well, yeah, but uh, Japan's high <laughs> debt-to-GDP ratio is not sustainable, he said. Mm-hmm. At least he's commenting on cryptocurrencies, though. He currently sees no serious problems from cryptocurrencies. Well... <laughs> That's good, but uh, I, I wonder if he sees a serious problem with them owning this three quarters of the ETF market. I wonder if Am- Apple or Amazon can just buy Japan, just buy the country. Ireland, maybe. <laughs> just take the debt, buy the country. So, so it, if if Japan owns itself, right? What kind of government is that? Is that like? a capitalist communist government or what kind of government is that? Well, the thing about owning ETFs is they have no power over the companies. They don't, they own representative shares. They don't own actual shares. So like they, they're not voting. They're not, they're not controlling the countries. They just own it. They just own ETFs that track the stocks. Is this a new kind of government that's not in Wikipedia that they're inventing? <laughs> I, don't know. Is this good? Is this bad? It seems like they can do it. It's terrible because at the end of the day, if the actual stocks were to were to plummet, um, the bank can't. They just continue to print money to hold these stocks up, and the yen drops down to such a low level that you can't. Like they can't import anything because nobody wants the yen. They take their currency and they make it like a third world currency. They make it worse. You ever see that like fake Zimbabwe million dollar note floating around? They make it like that. You just devalue the, the currency to the point where it has no value. And that's not good for anyone in Japan. No, that would be if, if there's a major global stock sell off, Japan is going to be in a they're going to be in a world of hurt. Yeah. Yeah. That, that yen is going to be worth about as much as an old DVD of an Al Franken movie. It's going to be <laughs> worth as much as Tesla vaporware. <laughs> 
I was just reading this came across. You did all right. So the Model Three deposits are secured. You know, if Tesla goes bankrupt, you you're a secured creditor, which means you're yeah. The all the deposits that they announced last night for the Roadster and the truck are unsecured. Would you make an unsecured deposit? Because if they go, if they go into, let's say they have to go into bankruptcy proceedings, your your money's gone. Listen, everybody learned their lesson during the financial crisis as to what is, at least I hope, as to what is even a secured deposit is. I mean, you had principal guaranteed notes with secured principal, secured by Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns. That when those companies went bankrupt, they were not secured. Those people did not get their money. Yep. So I wouldn't even do a secured deposit at Tesla, let alone an unsecured one. They're only as secure as the company is. Right, but now it's blatantly saying we're not even securing these. Yeah, so these, it's no, like my, <laughs> we're not even attempting to secure them. That's what's scary to me. It's like, okay, well, hey, we're not even going to pretend anymore. <laughs> Wow. All right. Do you buyer, want me to do, it's, do, you want me to buyer do beware? Buy? Do you want me to do yes. crude? What do you want me to do? I don't, do you have anything major on crude? There's, so crude this week, there's not a lot on crude. Um, we, we're seeing basically continued rhetoric from Mohamed Barkindo, who is the um, head of OPEC, essentially. He's the chairman of OPEC. Basically saying they want to re-up on the production cuts. IEA said demand is... Uh, falling. OPEC said demand is growing. One wants oil prices higher. The other has no skin in the game. Uh, the IEA is just a, just an, an energy analysis group. OPEC obviously wants prices higher. They also, the IEA also, I think somewhat irresponsibly, predicted a doubling of the U.S. oil production by 2025 uh, to the point where we're producing somewhere in the range of 16 to 18 million barrels a day. Record in the U.S. is a little over 10 million barrels a day. Um, 10.6, I think. Uh, but don't quote me on that. So crude oil just kind of fell back off after the Saudi purge didn't produce any sort of acceleration in tensions, at least for now, between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, supply has not been hurt. U.S. production continues to rise, and rig counts were up nine last Friday. This is Friday morning that we're recording this, so I don't know where rig counts are yet today. But they were up nine, which was the first substantial bump up in rig counts in the last, say, 16 weeks. So crude oil, uh, probably weaker. Uh, it's rallying today. As I'm speaking to you, I think, I think Brent is up about 2%. WTI might be up a little bit more. All crude oil did was adjust its range. Well, there's our crude oil. I still, if it, on a continued rally, the next target's still 58.50 mm -hmm. area. Uh, now, what's your why? Today's edition of The What and The Why is brought to you by Motive Wave Software. Motive Wave Software is a well-established developer of easy-to-use, full-featured charting, analysis, and trading software built for the individual trader. Motive Wave offers the best charting tools used by the pros, such as Elliott Wave, Fibonacci, Gartley, GAN, and Ratio Analysis, but it's presented in a very easy-to-use way. Motive Wave has a product to fit any budget and any trading style, and one of the very best features, it's available on Windows and Mac. So go to pathtradingpartners.com right now to get your 14-day free trial, and then visit them at motivewave.com. Um, you know, I was kind of torn on what I should do as a why this week. And I decided the why should be what's going to happen when we get a change of leadership at the Fed. And Jerome Powell, who was nominated and is likely to be confirmed, essentially never voted against the consensus on the Fed. The Fed is going to raise rates. Janet Yellen's last action is going to be to raise rates in December with her crew. And I think the the replacement for her, who's classified as a dove, who's never voted against the consensus, is not likely to come in with his rate hike guns blazing. So I am not in the camp that says there's going to be a March rate hike next year. I think the Fed's going to be cautious. I think Jerome Powell coming in, uh, he's not an academic, is going to know that his legacy is what happened to the economy and the equity markets. And he's not going to want to spark a recession. When you look back at recessions, recessions are often, if not always, preceded by a flat rate hike, a uh, flat yield curve. The yield curve is usually flattened um, in a bullish way by 
the Fed raising short-term rates and flattening the curve. So it's almost it's almost correct to say the Fed causes recessions. It's almost, it's not fully correct to say that, but it's almost correct to say that. And Powell's not going to want to do that, especially coming right in. He's going to want to let one develop. So I think the Fed is actually going to become more accommodative under Jerome Powell than it was under Janet Yellen. And that argues for continued higher stock prices. That's really all I have. Sure, but sweet okay. today. All right. Well, in continued higher stock prices, we have a potential double top in NASDAQ, calling it out early because we, I mean, we rallied 3% yesterday, wiping yeah. out like five, six days of losses. But if we do get a close below 62, 30, 75, it's actually a high probability double because yeah. the rotation zone is out of the way on the daily basis and let's check in on the weekly it's against the rotation zone on the weekly but the first target is well within the rotation zone on the weekly mm -hmm. the bottom of the rotation zone on the weekly is all the way back at 6020 and the first target on this if it does trigger the first full target is get the exact number it just scrolled off my screen the exact oh come on the First target is 61.44. The next target is 61.16. If that's that a good what? That is yeah, a good that's what? a good what. Although you expect higher prices, that's why you don't get in these early. You know, and by by the way, my why is is referencing end of Q1, beginning of Q2 next year. So we're talking about March of next year with the potential rate hike, and and Jerome Powell won't be confirmed until sometime in February. So. The, that what does not contradict with my why. Things are about duration. Timing. And in Speaking breaking, of timing. Sold on. In breaking news from CNBC, Walmart says it's planning to test Tesla's new electric trucks in 2020. There you go. That stock's through the roof. <laughs> well, uh, so there, there, there we go. Come on, so. you're joking, right? No, no. That was a joke. Nope. It's all about stock promotion this week. They're going to pump this up as much as possible. You know, as I always say with the fluff pieces and the press, or like whenever there's bad news, this is like, all right, we got to get as much out of this as possible before people realize we still can't produce a Model 3 in any uh, substantial way. And we run out of money in eight months. We keep talking about 2023. <laughs> yeah, the stock on that announcement, Mike, you ran up to like 320 and has fallen back now. It shot up to about 321.11. This, of course, as we speak, it's about 11.20 Chicago time right now. And now we're back down to about 3.15, so. We'll see how much they can, we'll see if they can keep pumping this or if it's just gonna have this quick little run up and then people are gonna go, well, let's see what they can continue to actually produce until then. I think he's probably disappointed right now because the thing was yesterday after the close, right? And yesterday, right. the close of Tesla, was 312.50 and right now we're, tra we're trading 315.45 it's only three bucks that's that's a huge disappointment it's less than one percent anyway and speaking it's, of time it's down it's down hold on what's it's down uh what did it open at today it opened at 325 and then it's now down yeah to it's down from the open correct way down so yeah down all right speaking of time open. speaking of time yeah that's it thanks for having me again guys i'm bob Iacchino. And I'm Mike Arnold.